Hello, world singers. My name is Tyler. My name is Brooke. And this is Cosmere Cosmere Conversations. Conversations. Hello, hello. Welcome back, everyone. So good to have you here. We have been working on this secret project that is not that secret. It's definitely not secret. I mentioned this back in like December, I think, and was like, it's coming soon. And here then we are. Other things two months happened later. instead. I have been working on this episode the whole time, though, to be fair. Because it takes a lot of work to get through aether of night i thought that we could do this episode without actually reading the book and very quickly i was like i'm gonna have to read this aren't i that doesn't make any (laughs) sense at all no we go deep and this time we think that we might actually be going deeper than most of the listeners i know all you listeners out there you are the top tier nerds in the cosmere community because you've read everything and you're for the hashtag all spoilers all the time but aether of night is a special case. Yeah, we should start by saying that it is non-canon. It is non-canon. It is not a Cosmere book, which is why we have not previously read it, have not discussed it on the podcast at all. And really, the only reason that we are bringing this into the podcast now is because sort of tentatively, Aethers have been brought into the Cosmere in a very small way. They are introduced into the Cosmere in the Rhythm of War, Ars Arcanum, sort of towards the end, when Chris writes, quote, I find electrifying the news out of the mountains of Ur, that their current queen seems to have been able to command the creation of an anti-investiture. Long theorized, this will be my first true evidence that it is possible and can only be created through intent. I think that perhaps Foyle, deep within his ocean, would find this information supports my theories over his, and he'd do well to listen to me on this matter if he ever wishes to achieve control over the Aethers, as he has insisted is his goal, end quote. Now, we could spend the next 25 minutes just talking about that passage from Chris. Oh, I think we have in the past. (laughs) But the... Because there's a lot of other things in there. But for this episode, the thing to take away is that foil, whoever it is, is trying to achieve control over the Aethers. Again, this means that Aethers are now officially part of the Cosmere in some way, shape, or form. And we're going to get to all of those sort of details in this episode. What I would like to do is play the role of a normal Cosmere fan who has not read Aether of Night and pick your brain a little bit about the backstory and the information that can be got out of Aether of Night while really just setting us up for, okay, how are Aethers going to play into the Cosmere? Because Aether of Night, the book, is not part of the Cosmere. Correct. But Aethers, the magic system or system of investiture that exists in the book, as you just mentioned, is back in play. Yes, correct. In this quote from Chris, it seems like she is hinting that Aethers have something to do with anti-investiture and something to do with creating investiture specifically with intent. And like those implications are not really mentioned or clear at all from the book Aether of Night. So I'm interested to see how that starts to come into play. Of note in that passage from Chris is that there are a couple of key capitalized words, which include, as you mentioned, intent, and that focus on intent, foil, which we've previously discussed, could be a shard, could be a person, could be a dragon. No one knows. Exactly. But the other one that is of importance is command. And because of the Nalthinian background and the focus there on commands and their role in the greater Cosmere, I find that capitalization Mm -hmm. at least worth mentioning. From my perspective and my way of bringing this into the Cosmere at large, it does seem like Aethers are another bonded type of magic where there is a magic user who is bonded in some way 
to a force of investiture. Yeah, I would say it's more like a spren bond mm-hmm. than a mistborn misting you're born with it type thing. Maybe it's maybe Megan, you're born Megalene. with it. Maybe <laughs> it's mistborn. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely has Spren Bond vibes, maybe a little bit too of the Seon vibe, because you can bond a Seon, it just doesn't do anything, or yeah. we don't know what it does. Yeah. Uh, but like that type of use of magic system is how I see this being incorporated into the Cosmere at large. It's going to fill curious, that slot. I'm curious if that aspect is actually going to remain in the magic system. Or if it's going to be tweaked to be a little bit different as it actually gets worked into the Cosmere properly. Because, and we can talk about all of these things, there are many, many pieces of Aether of Night that are very clearly cut and taken into Cosmere works that we know and love. And so in that way and many other ways, Aether of Night is quite clearly an early work of Brandon's. I wouldn't necessarily like really encourage you to read it. (laughs) It's not bad, but it's not great. It reads like someone's early work. And that is actually of note because originally Brandon only gave out copies of Aether of Night to fans that specifically requested via email that they could read this draft. And it included a little forward from Brandon explaining why he didn't continue to write or continue yeah. to finish this book. There's a long uh, forward basically discouraging you from reading it. <laughs> and of note, the acceptance of Aether of Night also used to include a promise not to discuss any of the details oh. of the book at all. Now, this has not been in place for many years uh, because the 17th shard eventually like took over control and management of people requesting the book and they dropped the requirement at that time because it was obviously becoming much more of a public thing but there are at least of note for the cosmere curious out there there are several works that brandon has kind of stamped with these they exist out there but I don't want you to talk about them at all. Aether of Night used to fit that role. And to my knowledge, the only thing remaining that Brandon doesn't want anyone to discuss, but that you can theoretically go see, is Dragonsteel Prime, which exists only as like a single copy at BYU, where Brandon teaches. So you have to physically go and you can check it out from the library there (laughs) and read it. Because it's, I think, part of his master's dissertation so like all of those are public yeah um or the pieces are public and to my knowledge after aether of night was more available to the public uh that becomes like the last little bit of the cosmere that's hidden away behind a corner well cosmere in quotes because again like not canon not a part of the cosmere as we know it that's true just i just think that's like really important that's like a really important disclaimer even on like all the stuff we're going to talk about today because brandon has been very clear that even though aethers are going to be part of the cosmere it will be different so with that big disclaimer let's go on our first well not first but maybe most significant foray into non-canon cosmere things aether of night Yeah, can you help summarize some of the major action and plot points and kind of give us a background on the story world itself? Yeah, there is kind of two important plot lines to know about in terms of Aether of Night. One is the sort of mythology plot line that is it, it bookends the story and it's in the background uh, of the whole book. And then there's the main plot line where you have, you know, all of your main characters and sort of the main action of the book. Now, I do want to mention that Brandon abandoned this book and will completely and totally rewrite it if he ever does because he felt that there was too big of a discrepancy in tone 
throughout the book. Mm -hmm. He was playing with a sort of Shakespearean trope of mistaken identity, which I think he does very successfully in this book. But it is sort of at odds with the other part of the plot, which is complete and total destruction of the world, which is very dark and does not really fit in with that other tone. Yeah, there's a little bit of whimsy. And then yeah. on the... Like, there's serious stuff going on, but it still feels light. It feels manageable. And then at the, the end... The end is just a... <laughs> I really real... understood what he was talking about. It was like a whole other world, very jarring and disjointed. and was just like, what? And so it makes sense why this work wasn't continued. Obviously, you know, he put a, this is a full length novel and this yeah. isn't just a, a short story or a one off. Like he put a lot of work into this. However, it was early in his career and he just went several different directions before eventually kind of returning and reincorporating some of these early ideas into the Cosmere. Yeah. Yeah, like it has good ideas. Again, we see some of the ideas manifest elsewhere in the Cosmere, but altogether it doesn't really work. So we start with the sort of mythological storyline. There are twin brothers, Agaris and Makal, which I immediately was like twins. Uh like and new relic. Yeah, and new from relic the Pure Lake, yes. from the Pure Lake. And their story is kind of similar. So I do wonder if this was transposed there. But these two brothers have been imprisoned by something called capital D Decay. Decay tells Agaris that he has won his battle with his brother. He is the master of Varia, which I'm assuming is the planet, but it's mm -hmm. never explicitly stated. And Decay tells him that he is not able to get out of his prison, but he might be able to find ways to still influence the world, quote, if he is clever, end quote. So clearly a lot of things here that we see with Ruin in Mistborn. Yeah, definitely a similar vibe here with the idea of a prison that is not a complete prison. It's not an absolute mm -hmm. prison. There's like a way for him to seep into the world still. And Decay was completely co-opted and made into Ruin, which is one of the reasons this book will not exist in this form. Because it can't. Like yeah. this is clearly like a story in part uh, about decay in the way that exactly. Vin's story was in part about ruin. Yeah. And so I think that that aspect is the clearest and most obvious thing that you can just take out or, or see was taken out and reincorporated. But then there is a lot of continuation of this story and it kind of goes in a different direction because of the overall vibe. You mentioned Shakespearean, but also kind of Roman in the in many respects kind of a, a Roman-esque world and yeah. that's it's kind of the direction it goes down trope but mm -hmm. the world is sort of Roman Empire inspired and so this idea of these two brothers who are in conflict and the eventuality of their situation for the humans in the world like you know this is long in the past right faded into myth and now these two brothers are known as slaughter and despair yeah and so obviously immediately as i start reading i'm trying to fit this book into our established cosmere mythological structure which we shouldn't do with shards and things and so but immediately i'm confused i'm like how is there decay who seems like a shard but then there's also these two brothers who are apparently gods yes like they have god power but i guess they're not shards because they're being imprisoned by shards so anyway for any listeners if you do try to read this just know that it's not in the Cosmere. <laughs> Try to just let it seep out of your mind, yeah. all the Cosmere it's connections. It's so hard. I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. Another thing I thought was interesting is that Agaris mentions his prison is made out of order, which he says is the substance of the universe. And another universal substance is mentioned called chaos. And so I was kind of thinking, are these maybe Dawn Shards? Order and chaos? I feel like that kind of fits, and there might be something like that that's been transposed over to 
the Cosmere. Just a thought, just throwing that out there. That's a good possible connection and possible existence. I always come back to the idea that we do not know enough or really that much at all about the Dawn Shards. Agree. And the what has to exist before or at least simultaneously as at a nauseum are these like underlying forces of the universe and then everything that we see everything that comes from that including the shards is all downstream a little bit and i think that brandon certainly was playing with these ideas and kind of this Mm -hmm. duplicity of order and chaos and slaughter and despair and what eventually becomes preservation and ruin you can see what he is interested in and what he is kind of working through mentally as he's Mm -hmm. building a story world we have a word of brandon from 2020 quote aethers as i have them now function without a shard's involvement and even predate the shattering note that's not yet canon end quote so i thought that was pretty fascinating yeah, absolutely. I mean, he is clearly bringing in aethers, and I think that's the connection that exists is the dawn shards or like the primal sources for Dragon Prince friends out there. <laughs> uh, I think that there's, you know, something else going on in the same way that the existence of sentient investiture doesn't necessarily need a shard. That like on Mm. Rashar, there were things that existed that were made from investiture or influenced by investiture. Yeah, but we kind of get the feeling that those were made from Adenalsium's investiture. So I guess maybe the same is true of Aethers because he just says they predate the shattering. Exactly. So Adenalsium existed, presumably. And so did investiture and Aethers is like one of the ways that the investiture leaked out. So I would, mm-hmm. you know, maybe compare them something more to the still really unknown old magic and oh, yeah. the kind of non shardic elements of the Cosmere. Yeah. When you see something or we eventually see like an entire world that's not a shard world, those are where the similarities might exist a little bit more. Don't look for direct connections to the shard powers. Mm -hmm. Instead, try to find those non-shard elements. And that, I think, is where Aether's going to be on display the most. That's a great thought. Back to sort of the main plot, just Mm -hmm. to give a super brief overview. There is a Roman Empire-ish thing happening. Our main character uh, has a mistaken identity situation where he is emperor and he is in a sort of epic, magical battle with dark forces. And the empire has this focus on duty. That's like the the moral heart of the story is doing your duty. Got to do your duty. Yeah. That's the most important thing. <laughs> Now, it's very, uh, there's some like Marcus Aurelius vibes going yeah, on. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. There's a lot of what we know now are signature Sandersonian plot points. You've got epic battles. You've got politics, politics like on the fringes. You've got lots of twists where the good guys are really the bad guys. And you should have seen it all along, but you didn't. <laughs> Maybe not. You should have seen it all along. And I think that's one of the things that maybe doesn't work as well about this story is that the plot twists do kind of seem to come out of nowhere or like seem confusing when they're revealed so you know again early work never went through any kind of editing process you can't like be too hard on him we already talked about how decay became ruin in mistborn other sort of similarities to other aspects of the cosmere one thing i thought was super interesting is that Another way it's similar to Mistborn is that the magic system seems to be a set of paired elements or like paired powers. Mm. The main character sort of comes up up with this hypothesis during the course of the book is like, oh, these two go together and these two go together and these two go together. I'm curious if like Mistborn, there's going to be a wrench in there somewhere where we think it's a nice neat table and then we realize that our knowledge is wrong that doesn't happen in the book but i'm curious if it will it certainly seems like 
aether and the kind of uh, very like connection to the physical world or or connection to uh, primal elements uh, is similar to the metallic arts and their connection to not just like that paired aspect, but the entire nature of the way those powers interact and can be mashed together, mixed together, and you get things that are, you know, oh. possible to do that originally you didn't even know you had the capability, but you had the capability the entire time because it's like a simple yeah. mixing of the powers. I mean, that's also not really explored in the book, so exactly. I don't it's know. one of those things that just could possibly maybe but well one thing that's different at least in this book which might change later is that the paired elements like cancel each other out so i don't think you could pair like actually merge those two together they're always going to yeah. remain separate they're like oil and water ish mm, got you okay they're both liquid well, then you just need so they an go emulsifier. together but <laughs> okay so let's actually talk about the system because it is a little bit misborny but then it also has like a surge vibe also. This is sort of the rough structure that the main character comes up with. You've got amberite, which is a pink like crystalline rock substance that characters who have bonded amberite are able to grow this crystalline substance uh, from their hand, like into a sword, or if you're really powerful, you can grow it into a full arm covered in crystal or a full suit covered in crystal. And we will come back to this, but of note that Amberite has been seen in the Cosmere. Yes, we will come back to that. Let's go to the next one, though. Next is Verdant, which is exactly what it sounds like. Plants, specifically vines, again, that can be grown out of one's hand and used in a variety of ways. So the main character notes that these two elements both have growth in common, or we might say progression. Yeah, I definitely was getting Wendell vibes from the Verdant user. What I do think is interesting to note of the magic users or the Aether users is the kind of way that the magic kind of expresses itself around them, but then can be hidden down to a very, very small like ring size on their finger. Oh, yeah. Of just how they can't make the magic disappear, the Aether disappear. Right. I was just going to say it can actually disappear, which is you can never hide it fully. Exactly. And I, I found that an interesting aspect. But let's continue down. So the, that's the first of the pairings mm -hmm. with growth in common. What are the next two? The next two are Ferris, which is metal ability. And I don't know, it's not shown if there's like a medium aspect of Ferris. We see Ferris bonded people who are like basically regular humans or Ferris bonded people who have gone through a complete transformation and are now metal machines, yeah. basically. And they use these Ferris people question mark <laughs> to create transportation machines so like walking little crab things that carry people and heaters is what we see most often and lights i think i think mm -hmm. they also become lights and this is really it's remarked on early about how other people think this is strange but like there is a soul in the machines that makes some yeah. of the city operate. Again, it's one of those things that's like not really fully explained and like doesn't totally make sense, but it seems that the person, the Ferris bonded person, like still exists so much to the point where the other Ferris bonds who have not transformed are assigned like at all times to be accompanying mm -hmm. They're the, like working for the metal yes. things just to like keep them company basically and like i guess keep them from going crazy that also is like not really explained it's just like there's a person in there and so this person needs to keep them company which is nice but like wild incredibly wild and such a it's it kind of reminded me of the difference between a chandra and the mist wraiths you know and oh. the, the different states of consciousness that they exist but like maybe 
this way they're they're kind of going backwards not not really necessarily backwards the machines are cool i guess but like they're giving up their human form and, and a more direct connection to the yeah, physical i think i almost think of it more as uh like a soul caster who uses the power so much that they then like become start to become the substance they're making yeah absolutely it seems kind of like that but to maybe less degree. useful and yeah. like weird. <laughs> I mean, they they have uses. And there's another one that is kind of transformation oriented. Yeah. So the so quote unquote paired power to Ferris is I'm saying it beasterin because I want it to sound like an animal because that's what it's about. <laughs> Beast Erin. And the other ones kind of all make sense. Uh, anyway, Beasterin is a transformation of the bonded person into an animal slash human person. So they have different aspects of themselves that are different animal body parts like someone has a hawk hand and someone has like an owl eyeball but i think they also say that they don't do it like on purpose it's only if they like get wounded in battle and then it's like oh you lost your hand well good thing we can graft an animal hand on there but so now you still have a hand yeah the, the first thing that if you're a magic user who is able to do this I'm transforming myself ASAP. Like all the other dude gets to turn into a metal machine guy and you're like, <laughs> only if you get wounded? No, that doesn't make any sense. Like I'm having all of the different animal powers. I want to basically be an anamorph and be able to shift from one to the other. They can't do that. It's just like- Well, it is an useful ally. in other ways too. You like don't necessarily have to have such a big transformation, but it's like saves lives in many ways. So they're prized soldiers- on this world because if they do get wounded they're like fine they're very easily healed and therefore they can carry on their Keep fighting, fighting yeah. yes exactly just like <laughs> keep being a good soldier so as you said these two powers have the transformation quote unquote surge making them similar and then we get to the last two which are sort of maybe god powers question mark again very unclear this is one of the things at the end where i was like wait so what <laughs> but uh so those four that we already mentioned are kind of the most popular powers that are most commonly found and then there is illuminous which the actual practical power is seen but they don't know that it is an aether it's like shrouded in mystery in the religion. And Illuminous is kind of the power of light, but also uh, transportation-ish. It allows the special priests to... Teleport. Yes, to teleport other people. Important to note that these priests cannot teleport themselves. They can only teleport others through this Illuminous aether bond throughout the course of the book we discover along with the main character the power of night hence aether of night and this is the power of darkness again i guess maybe ish it's the other side of the illuminous aether and it is the opposite it allows the person to teleport themselves but no one else Unless you are like literally holding the other person, you know, you can bring what's on right. your body, exactly. basically what you can carry, but uh, you can't just send other people like the priests can. So clearly these two have transportation theme and a little bit of a God connection that is unclear, but maybe they're like, they've got the black and white, but the black one is actually the good one and the white one is actually the bad one. Just to mix things up. Yeah, just a classic role reversal. <laughs> yeah. You didn't see that coming, did <laughs> <Yeah>. you, kids? <laughs> so there we go. There's our Aethers. As they exist right now, they definitely have potential, but also we can in no way speculate that these Aethers are going to be the Aethers that Brandon brings into the cosmos. Right. Or that they will work in this way. It also seems like there will be more of them, and we'll yes. get to that in just a second. For now, 
Let's talk about our Aether sightings that we have in canon Cosmere works because, because there, we have seen some. Yeah, and some may surprise you. I think that there's one that's like very there's obvious. There's one that's obvious. We all know. We've been speculating about it for years. But I did want to bring up a call out a little bit to the Shadow and Bone series, which is also a Netflix show now. Aether of Night and the Illuminous Aether definitely reminded me of the two main characters in there that's a good call who you know are flipping the same coin but on two different sides of the equation basically and that is the vibe that i was kind of left with a little bit or at least the explanation that i gave myself as i was going through (laughs) i was just like okay it's a little bit like shadow and bone Eh, next page tell me a little bit about the aethers we've seen in the cosmere well the one that we have all been speculating about for many, many years now is that there is an Aether in Mraze's display cabinet of investiture, that pink, chalky, crystalline thing in the cabinet is an Aether. 100% confirmed. Yeah, it comes from a word of Brandon and everything. He says, quote, Mraze has some Aether, some bits of Aether in his little collection, end quote. One thing that made this more interesting to me upon reading Aether of Night properly is that in Aether of Night, it's specifically mentioned that the Aether cannot survive like outside of its bonded human. Mm. So if a character makes a, an Aether sword and then drops the sword, the sword just crumbles into dust. Like it has to be still connected to the human in order to keep its shape. But at least of what I remember from that description of Marais's display cabinet is that the thing is like a rock, like it's together. There is some like dust around it. She describes it as being chalky, yeah. but like it's together. So I thought that was very interesting. I think that's actually of note and maybe important. So clearly we've speculated before about what is this pink chalky stone that Marais has. And I'm just going to continue the speculation. Now we know it's Aether. We believe it is Amberite. And I believe the existence of it in a stone shape is actually important to what Marais's goal is mm, and Thydekar's goal. That's a great goal, call. Yep. Because they are in To be part able to preserve it off-world, off-world or yeah, disconnected. disconnected from the human that is supposed to be bonded with they somehow figured out and now have it on display that they figured out how to disconnect and maintain the magic in that form without the direct human bond so i think it's a a deeper hint about what marie's and remember this is from as early as book two in the stormlight archive yeah Uh, but in oathbringer we actually get more information from Marais about Aether. Yeah, there's quite a bit in Oathbringer. In the Mem interlude, Mem is tasked with removing an unusual stain on Marais's fancy clothes. And it's told from her perspective, and she is commenting about how she's been trying to remove it, and she really had a hard time, but eventually she did it. And she did it without damaging the fabric. And Mraze gives her big props for her success. And a little bonus. Yeah, gives her a bonus. Like, he's very impressed with her. She's the best laundry woman on Rashar, apparently. Um, And he mentions at that point that the stain is Aether. It's mentioned to be, like, kind of a dark reddish yeah, color. Yeah, oil and blood yeah, is how is what she, she describes it. It might be. And so I thought that was interesting because amberite is definitely described as being a rosy, like pink color, more like that rock. And there's not really any aether in the book anyway that is that color. So I was thinking it might be a night amberite combo, which we do actually see in Aether of Night. This is what I was talking about when it comes to combinations of things. I, yeah, if I the just... night and illuminous are emulsifiers in a way, or they're like the thing that can be linked. They're the carbon atoms, yeah. if you will. They can bond to everything. And that 
connection Maybe, between. But then I also wonder if it's more of a corruption situation. Oh, certainly. Like, I could is definitely it actually a blending or is it that night is corrupting the Amberite? Like, I don't know. With Chris's call out that we started this episode with regarding Navani's creation yeah. of anti investiture, I would think that maybe Aether, specifically Knight and Illuminus, are maybe akin to that. There's some like anti investiture aspect going on. And therefore, that's why they can mix with the other aethers but maybe the aethers can't mix with each other like you can't put the animal one and the metal one together yeah so okay let's move on to our words of brandon because this is gonna give us some yes more detail more information (laughs) we're gonna go deep into the archive for words of brandon i want to first start with just a plain old word of brandon that the aether world is quote unquote a 12 world much like Rashar is a 10 world or Scadrill is a 16 world. So this is of note because at least right now there's only six Aethers. But if there's only going to be 12, then like they can't blend with both Illuminous and Knight. So my thought is maybe the anti-investiture is going to come up with an anti-Amberite an anti-verdant, an anti-ferris, et cetera, that will then make 12. And you would also have, I guess, anti-illuminous and anti-knight? You would have a, a, lum- a luminous knight? <laughs> maybe, maybe that's or, what it is. Go ahead. Or there is an undiscovered aether, mm. and knight and illuminous are actually the investiture-anti-investiture pair. And then there's going to be a sixth aether and it's anti-investiture. So we know that's a lot of speculation <laughs> based on the single concept of a 12 world. But it just starts to like beg so many questions. And we know Brandon does this in his other works. And so that is why I think the speculation is justified because this is the type of thing that he has clearly always been working on and incorporating into his stories. But right now... We don't have enough information. No, we do I, I think that it's going to become clear, though, for example, ending up with 12 or a variation of 12 Aethers, I think would be a nice match for what else is going on in the Cosmere. Like, I know that Aether of Night is probably not going to be a book in the Cosmere, but I, I just like the idea that the worlds are all working together. <laughs> You want to be another questioner? I would love to be a questioner. Quote, are there still six different types of aethers in current canon, or has that changed? Brandon said, they have expanded. I'm using the aethers behind the scenes for a lot of space age things. And because I'm doing that, I'm adding in a few more aethers. There's going to be some limits on this. I'm tweaking which aethers I'm actually making because some of them didn't work as well as other ones. There will end up being more, but I won't canonize the number until I have the aether book ready to release. End quote. Interesting stuff there. Definitely makes me question about like, how (laughs) are these aethers going to be used in the space space age? age? Exactly. So like the biggest thing that I've been thinking is obviously the corpates, which are the human metal metal things, would be like the best candidate for that. But we really haven't seen them do anything that complex yet. And then also like, how would the other aethers be any help? In Space Age, I don't know. Which is why I think that where Aethers could be going is similar to the way that we see the metallic arts going, which is like the combinations of things. I don't know how they combine or the way that they combine, but if you had Amberite, this natural material that can be grown Mm -hmm. but then you could somehow like purify that by mixing it with another aether then maybe you could like grow ships and that would be way better than trying to produce the material uh from metal like a combination between the amberites and the metal dudes and yeah the machines become like 
operating out of the material that's already there and you have some growth and progression it's like i see all the possibilities <laughs> existing but at the same time it's very unclear how as it is. it is right now it does seem like amberite is still going to be one of the aethers that he's working with since we've seen it uh in book in the stormlight archive but i could see him getting rid of the beasterin aether i could see him maybe getting rid of the verdant aether just because, again, like, what are, good are vines going to do you in space? <laughs> you can't really, like, spidey vine swing your way to another planet. Just in between the vacuum. You just spidey out <laughs> yeah. and it just keeps going. It goes forever and you just you follow just grow that the right along. the longest yeah. vine in the world. <laughs> you just lasso the moon. Come on, Mary. Lasso that moon yeah. for you. <laughs> the concept, though, of space age needing aether involved that to me that is interesting that brandon was trying to imagine the space age of the cosmere and was like i can't do this without aether like mm -hmm. he, he wanted to bring it in specifically seemingly to help with that aspect that means it's important and i don't yeah. know how all of these things are going to play out well and let's go to this next word of brandon because this might actually factor in lose theron telescope asks quote are the Aethers native to multiple worlds? And Brandon said, currently no, but they have spread and they claim to be not from any world, end quote. So I think that might indicate that maybe instead of the Aethers mixing together like internally, we're going to see Aethers mixing with other forms of investiture. Oh, and like, that would be interesting. Because the Aethers are not, their identity, capital I identity, is <sighs> not connected to any particular world or any particular mm. shard. They're going to be super versatile and like able to mix with any other type of investiture. So we might not see Ferris aether combining with amberite aether we might see ferrous aether combining with metals on scadrial or amberite mixing with rock and stone on rashar or something like that that obviously just blew my brain because <laughs> of all the possible combinations just started running through my head and it's too many uh, but yeah too many i like that a concept though that the aethers have both spread and that they don't claim any one world as an origin. It kind of reinforces that idea we talked about earlier about the Dawn Shards and kind of the primal forces that mm -hmm. existed outside of just the Shards. Well, and there's a question that's brought up in Aether of Night that's not really properly answered. And I would hope we would maybe start to get an answer as they're brought into the Cosmere. But that question is the origin of the aethers and like where they spawn from essentially mm -hmm. yeah. no one the humans don't really know because they pass them down through their genetic lines so in order for a son to get his aether bond the father will chip off a piece of his aether and give it to his son and so they're completely disconnected from the original place where the aethers come from and so i am curious like how they are existing and like is there a place where they are just being made and then like i mean obviously some of the spread is from humans mm -hmm. like picking them up and taking them but then i also am just like are they just like wandering around the cosmere on their own to me, there's maybe an answer to the question that you had before, which is why do we need verdant, uh, you know, compared mm -hmm. to like the amberite? Maybe there is an aspect of aether that is part of the cognitive realm. And so verdant grows theoretically in the cognitive realm. That's how it's spreading. It's like traveling oh, through the cognitive... You just want this to be another mushroom situation. I always want there to be a mushroom situation. <laughs> that is a reference to our very special book club over on Patreon, which you can join, become a patron, listen to our super cool conversations about the Skyward Flight series and all of the awesome mushrooms that exist there. No, what I, I think that I'm trying to make the connection, the broader connection to Aether's existing outside of the shards and 
perhaps also already in place throughout the Cosmere Mm -hmm. to be utilized in the manner that you said Mm -hmm. of combining with the types of investiture that we see on the individual shard worlds and all that is going to come about from the space age into the Cosmere is because the resource that is needed, Aether, is all around them already. And they don't realize it's the Mm. same way that like electricity, you know, Nikola Tesla famously believed that we could summon electricity out of the air, that there was a way to capture it directly and that you wouldn't have to worry about wires or the big transmission lines or anything like that, that you could pull electricity out of the air. We're not quite there. We've gotten pretty far to like doing cool stuff like that. Some of you are like, I have the newest phone and it does just (laughs) charge when I throw it down on a brick or whatever. But that concept of the Aether being all around them and they are just going to near simultaneously because of the work of someone like Thydekar all figure out the same thing basically at the same time. Hmm. And that it jump starts the space age of the Cosmere overall. I could see Maybe. that being a way that it is broadly incorporated is that it's already there. Or it's once you like figure out how to access it in the cognitive realm, it's very easy to like pull yeah. it into your physical reality. Totally possible. It's all possible. We don't know anything. We don't know anything. We know everything. <laughs> there is so much going on. And when Aether of Night the story ends it definitely is leaning into that destruction of the world and just it's it ends on a real bummer note (laughs) brandon was certainly like watching a lot of armageddon or just you know the 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 world is ending deep impact that's the one armageddon ends happily deep (laughs) impacts the one we're just like no it, it hit us there's like a weird like guardians of the galaxy 2 situation with uh quill's dad ego yes there's like an ego situation which is weird and then yeah it just ends like super dark with really no hope which is not very sandersonian sanderson has stated so many times that he's not really interested in doing quote unquote grim dark Mm -hmm. he likes putting at least an element of hope and positivity into his stories so that was a surprise and i don't know if he just like did it know how to end it or what it definitely feels like the ending <laughs> was rushed and endings are always difficult it's to like do. everything is fine just kidding everyone's going to die the end and you're the like end. the book is now oh, over. okay <laughs> Good- goodbye now yeah. it seems like what it was missing was that setup that he eventually nails in Mistborn era one where there is this character that we follow and she grows and becomes eventually in the place where the world can end but because of her actions Mm, and and because of the characters we know then there's rebirth yeah and like that's what aether of night seemingly is missing it's just like these characters are going about their business but we don't necessarily have the same emotional connection to them and then their world ends and nothing seemingly their actions weren't yeah as important. there's like no payoff there's no catharsis mm-hmm. really again like i don't want to be too hard on it because there's like a two-page forward saying like please understand this is not a good book that i don't like really <laughs> i mean he's right like he's completely right read the forward he's a hundred percent honest about the state of this book and I think to your point of these things working better in Mistborn, it's very clear that he had the ideas. He had a lot of ideas, but they weren't crystallized. Yeah, they were refined. Yeah, like figured out fully. Like he kind of had the mythological structure, but he didn't really know what was happening behind the scenes or how everything tied together and what the relationships were in like the sort of big picture spiritual cosmic situation. And that just really affects then what happens when you're having a big magical spiritual war on the world like if you don't really know how it works it's not going to work out very well yes it's exactly how the showrunners of game of thrones felt about the night (laughs) king they were just like oh we don't we don't know we actually don't know We, we don't know what this guy does he's just there yeah being all scary what's his power why is he scary let's stab him and then all the problems will be solved 
Stabby, stabby. I think what you have mentioned is exactly on point, that Aether of Night as a book is not a finished product. And the idea that it exists... It's more like a playground. Yes. Oh, that's a right? great way. He's of- just kind of like playing around with things, throwing around different concepts, and then he takes them all apart, puts them into other things, and like refines them. That is an awesome way to think about it. Sandbox mode in your video game, but not the video game story itself. No. It is just the open world. It's a charcuterie platter. Oh, I was going to say a Minecraft world. That <laughs> shows where our brains <laughs> exist. It's just the, That's the f- a really good just baseline for our personalities. <laughs> That's all you need to know about us. Yeah. It's either a Minecraft world or charcuterie. <laughs> so I think there are a bunch of important things that can be taken out of Aether of Night, especially as Brandon has mentioned and brought them into the Cosmere as a power. And what I really think is important, and what I've taken out of this, is that aspect of Aether being valuable to the space age of the mm-hmm. Cosmere, and down the road it being a important power. And what you said about the Aethers combining with the shard powers that we already know, to me, starts to seem like their most likely entry point into the Cosmere. Not as like a separate book or a, I think the book yeah. is actually straight up off the state of the Sanderson from the most recent year where it used to always exist like way down Somewhere at the bottom. There. Yeah, now it's just been taken off entirely. So I think that's gone. Yeah, he's always been kind of like, look, I don't really know if I'm ever going to write this because it would have to be a complete overhaul rewrite i think he at this point is just going to try to work them into the cosmere stories that he's already writing but when we have things like don shard hoyd's story and the assuming continued importance of characters like chris all playing with these concepts of aether and now clearly this big thing done by navani who created anti-investiture like maybe anti-investiture is an aether as we were talking about earlier (sighs) there's some type of way that you can command create by intent a power outside of the shard powers i don't think that is on point at all (laughs) i think anti-investiture is just like a function of the way investiture works in the cosmere period I don't think you're making a different form of investiture by creating anti-investiture. You know, like anti-stormlight is not an aether. It's just anti-stormlight. Yes, but it is a thing that is created by Navani's intent in Rhythm of War. And there is no... There's a shard involved, kind of, in that there's the power of a shard in Mm -hmm. the form of investiture and stormlight... Or, or tower light or any of the lights that they're using. But I also think that the concept of not needing to be a shard in order to create or generate this power, this form of power, anti-investiture in Navani's case, and maybe Aether is what Chris is seen as the similarity and like how those things are in play. Because I think we have talked a lot about how Aether is a power not of the shards. Mm -hmm. And so like that is maybe what Chris is interested in. She's clearly studying the powers of the shards and the different types of investiture, but she's also learned, maybe the biggest thing that she's learned is that there is another form of power that exists that is not connected necessarily to the shards. Let us know what you think about Aether of Night. If you have gone through and read it, you have to request that directly from the 17th shard if you are interested and if you have any theories about how aether as a magic system will be used in the cosmere let us know on all of the different social media feeds really appreciate you staying along for this one we know very tangential very disconnected and discombobulated but also we hope yeah i feel like this is going to be a great resource for the people this to exist as a source for 
people especially who are not going to take the time to read this other outside book uh, that can prepare you and, and have yeah, you on the lookout have the basics for and then you Aether. can just dive in when it's actually canon and like you'll have the background you need we are next going to be jumping into some of your episode requests slash ideas so keep your eye on the podcast feed those are coming up and until next time life before death strength before weakness journey before destination <laughs>